Right, folks, a very good morning to you and welcome. For those of you who are listening to this after the event, it's really great to have you join with us as well. We're considering a message I have entitled False Apostles and Deceitful Workers. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to read from verse 13 through to verse 28. A lengthy reading. We're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through to verse 28. The Apostle Paul, writing here to the church in Corinth, he writes the second letter that is placed in Scripture. It is my understanding that Paul actually wrote another letter to the Corinthians that is not part of Scripture, but ultimately, as we look at this this morning, um, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. 2nd Corinthians chapter 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool, receive me that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak is not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that came which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Father God, as we read your word this morning, as we come to study it, read it, believe it, and trust it, and have it effectually work within us. Gracious Lord, we pray you would teach us what you would have us to know through your Holy Spirit that lives within each and every one of us as believers, as we take your word and we take it seriously. May it do the work it has been designed to do. We give you thanks. We give you praise. By Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, folks, as we look at the word here this morning, the apostle is saying, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now, the word apostle means messenger, messenger, someone who is who is bringing a message. And the Apostle Paul is warning the Corinthian believers that there are false apostles. So that, by implication, means can we have false apostles today? Now, I will just say this to you, and I mean no disrespect to anyone uh, in terms of in leadership or understanding, but if anybody says to you, Apostle so-and-so is here to speak, don't even put on your tackies, just run. There are no God-appointed apostles in this day and age that we live in, in this time period of God's grace. If somebody says, prophet so-and-so is speaking at this organization, don't waste your time. Now, it sounds rather harsh, right? But I understand and know, and I, my responsibility is to warn you through the truth of God's word that these folks, I would categorize and say, if they would classify themselves as an apostle or as a prophet, then they are certainly not bringing you the truth of God's word. And I say that based on the authority of Scripture, not because of 
anything that I'm just making up or saying. And it is my responsibility, my duty, I do believe, to warn, not because I am better than anybody else. I stand here and you know and understand that often I will say to you that the only reason I have the privilege and, and the ability to stand here and to bring this message to you is because of God's grace. Nothing that I could have ever done or got myself to a position of this esteemed authority because it is not. The apostle says that, you know, he would not have dominion over the faith of the Corinthians, but to be helpers of their joy. Go with me. Just keep your hand in 2 Corinthians and, and just page a little bit back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, where the apostle says, not that we have dominion over your faith. And that, dominion, that word dominion means control. I'm not here to control what you must and mustn't believe, folks. You understand and you know that God has given each and every one of us freedom of choice. And I thank you that you've chosen to be here this morning and for you folk online. And if you've clicked on this and you've found this message on YouTube and you're listening to this, thank you for the opportunity of sharing with you. However, you cannot make me the source of your truth. You have to make God's word your final authority. I thank you that you listen and you hear and you measure what we say to you through the word of God, because ultimately, at the end of the day, we can fail you. And so where the apostle Paul says, not that we have dominion over your faith, but notice what he says, but are what? Helpers of your joy. For by faith ye stand. We sang that song. Here in the grace of God, I stand. Why? Because we stand in God's grace. We are not able to win God's grace or his favor through any keeping of the law or any work that we can do. We as believers go out and do the work that we need to do because we are saved by God's grace through our faith in what Christ did and accomplished for us. How amazing is that? We spoke earlier, I mentioned just before the message, and for those of you who are listening online, I'll just repeat something now so that it's on the recording, and that is uh, we conducted a wedding yesterday in Hookville, beautiful area in Hookville, and there was this chapel we found, and it, it was first used in 1865. Beautiful, out in the, in the, um, in the sticks of nowhere on the, on the farms. You have to travel quite far. And to this day, that chapel has no electricity, not because it was load shedding at the time, but simply because it just has no facilities of electricity. And yet, the interesting thing was when I looked at the design and how it is designed, the wall facing the, the predominant oncoming stormy weather, which would have come, which would come from Cape Town, is solid. And yet the others are all designed so that the natural light, if you go in, it's just natural light. No matter what angle the sun is, you would get natural light. So you can just imagine how this, this was designed. Then the other interesting factor is when you walk around this chapel, um, well, church, rather big chapel, um, um, in the garden are graves. Of all the folks that were involved, and you could see many of them had, had come as as immigrants and come from the UK and various other places and they had been born elsewhere but moved there and then obviously the, the, the people that started and were involved with the building of the chapel they are buried in the the place and I was looking at the dates and so forth and you'd see some folks who passed away at a rather young age you know 35, 47, that kind of thing, and little children that were, were buried there. And I, and I stood there and I thought, you know, it's so fascinating because th this was a whole life. And all of those people have gone on before I was even born. They were born and passed away before I was even born. And you think, wow, people used to come to this, this chapel and, and come and hear. I hope they came to hear the truth of God's word and not sort of fables and stories and stuff. But that's the reality. You know, you, you think of that, and I don't tell you that to, to depress you and say, well, you know, that's the reality of life, folks. We are born into this world, and whether we, we are 2, 22, 102, there was a lady there, she was 98. And can you imagine reaching 98, but you're living on a, in, this is not somebody living in the town and everything gets done. You understand. This is living the hard life. 98. I thought, wow. But my question would be, where are those folk now? Did they trust in the truth of God's word? Did they trust? And were they, were they taught the truth? I pray so. So when we look at this, and Paul the Apostle says he didn't want to have dominion over the faith of the Corinthians and by implication any other believer, neither do we want to have dominion over your faith. You know that if, if you 
have to look at it and understand that ultimately at the end of the day, God's word is going to be and will be, continue to be your final authority. And that's why Paul the Apostle warns very clearly here, false apostles, deceitful workers. Now notice, how do they operate? Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. You see that? You understand that people can come and talk about Jesus and use the word and say Jesus this and Jesus that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, are they speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ? And are they speaking about the truth of God's word? And are they giving you the clarity of the gospel, the clarity of the good news? What is the clarity of the good news? Anybody who tells you anything other than the fact that you need to believe and trust that Jesus Christ paid for your sin, completely paid for your sin on the cross at Calvary, then died, was buried, and rose again, is telling you a false gospel, is a false apostle, is a deceitful worker. If they now come and they add on works-based religion, which is what these Corinthians were now facing, because I'm going to show you where the Apostle Paul addresses this. Then they are adding to something to the clarity of the gospel. Now, is it good that we keep the commandments, the Ten Commandments, folks? Yes. But you do that, and the only way you can truly understand and know and do that and look at the whole scripture and and actually live in accordance with that is to have God, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit living within you. And then you take God's word and you allow God's word to do the work. And the word of God does the work. And you have scripture that you can then rely on in, and teach you how should a husband act? How should a wife act? How should children act? How should a parent act and react? And if you read through the Apostle Paul's writings... The 13 books, you will get clarity on that as well as the rest of scripture. But specifically today, how do we deal with that? Because if you go and take the Old Testament and you don't apply the correct scripture, you know and understand that the Old Testament says if you have an unruly child, you bring them to the church leadership and what they're going to do. Anyone want to guess? Stone them. Now, can you do that today? No, it's in scripture. Is that the way we act? Oh, don't look so worried. No, we're not, <laughs> not going to do that, guys. That's not the way it happens. The scripture today, Paul the Apostle says, Father, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Now, I know and I understand that you come home from a long, hard day. And, you know, then you have to deal with your beautiful children and grandchildren and so forth and teach them. That's why the Bible says, train up a child. Why? It takes effort. It takes energy. It takes training. Each and every one of us need to know and understand that if we're going to look at God's word and look at the scripture, we are going to be taught these things. And Paul is warning and he says in verse 14, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Folks, Satan is not going to come with two horns and a pitched fork and, you know, and you're going to stand and say, well, that's him. That's not how he operates. He transforms himself and he says, verse 15, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transformed as the ministers of righteousness. You understand that they are, there can be ministers of Satan accomplishing what he wants to accomplish who stand behind pulpits. Who are given authority in organizations who have dominion over their people. You understand that? Now, God is a God of order. He is a God who wants structure and order. And when we come in here, you'll notice chairs are put neatly and set out. And in the teacups, see some of the letters, the, the, the handles in the correct way will make sense. Because if you don't want to pick it up, you... I understand that. You need to have structure and order. I, I, I pack the dishwasher and I pack it in a particular way so when I unpack it, it's easy. We understand that. I like structure and order. I'm not against that. But the structure and order must not come having dominion over people. That's the point. 
And the Apostle Paul warns here and he says, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. The interesting thing, if you read in the Old Testament, Satan, his name, Lucifer, looks fairer. Bearer of light. He was, when he was created, perfect, the Bible says. And over the throne of God, Beautiful in his in his makeup and colors. He had musical instruments built into him. And the reason for that is so that he could lead the whole angelic realm in worship of God. What did he do? He took that and he tried to be like the most high. So if Satan was that and that's the way he operates, what do you think he's going to be using today, folks? as part of his primary way to get people to not focus on the truth. Music. Now, music is good. But, the late Fudy always used to say, rhythm and melody. You need to know what you're singing and how you sing it. I keep hearing his voice like that. Not this rep repetitive, emotional hype, Stand for half an hour with your eyes, your arms. You know that if you stand like this with your arms, around, you're going to start feeling lightheaded and you're going to start feeling all strange and kind of funny kind of things, folks. And then in some sets of worship, what you feel there is nothing that you see different to what you see at some crazy concerts. Sounding a bit harsh this morning, but that's the reality we need to be aware of. That we need to protect our children and our grandchildren. We need to protect ourselves. Why? Because Paul the Apostle is warning about this. And I truly believe as the days go on and as the Lord tarries, folks, we are moving into an era where this is happening at an exponential rate. And we need to be mindful of this. Therefore, verse 15, it is no great thing if the ministers also be transformed into the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Sinjin, can I ask you to just close that window? Sorry, man. I left it open for some air to blow through, but it's just, it's not creating music. It's creating a noise. Thank you, my good man. And the reason why I asked him is, look how tall he is. He can just close it without any effort. Thank you. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You see that? And then he goes on further and he says, verse 19, um, or verse 18, see that many glory after the flesh. I will glory also. Paul's saying, listen, seeing as everybody's coming along boasting after the flesh, let me, let me just also just boast here a little bit, if that's what they want to do. For ye suffer fools gladly. That word suffer means endure or allow. You allow fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. In other words, thinking, oh, we, we've got this. We know this. Let's just let these people come and share stuff with us. And Paul is very, very, the Apostle Paul is very, very uh, mindful and wary and warning of this, of what we allow to take place. Verse 20, for ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage. You put up with it. You allow it to happen. If a man put you into bondage. If a man devour you. If a man take of you. In other words, if he enslaves you. If he keeps you. If he it captures you. You're allowing this to happen. How can this be possible? What did he say in 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 20, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 24? I do not want to have dominion over your faith. And what were these Corinthians allowing? They, they were allowing these folks to come in, these Judaizers, and they were coming in and they were changing the fact that they believed and trusted and knew and understood that they were saved by grace through faith. Now, all of a sudden, they were allowing these folks to come in and to teach them stuff which was not true. If a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, that word smite you on the face. Do you know a story about that? Where Jesus says, he strikes you, that insults you. You know, the saying goes, you know, if he 
smite you on the one cheek, turn and giving the other cheek, but the Bible doesn't say what you do after that. Okay. You don't catch that, right? But it's, but by the way, and in the one scripture it says smite you on the right cheek. How can someone smite you on the right cheek? Backhand. It's not a fist. It's a backhand. It's an insult. Insults you. In other words, what, what the scripture is saying, someone insults you, let him insult you. But no one understand who you are and who you are in Christ. But he's saying you allow this to happen. Then verse 22 says, are they Hebrews? Yes, so am I. Are they Israelites? Yes, so am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? Yes, so am I. So these guys are coming saying, no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. You can't believe and trust this. Paul's saying, you see, think about this. The scriptures say, and Paul says, that he was the chief of sinners. That doesn't mean he committed the most sin, but he was the leader of the rebellion. He was a Hebrew. He was an Israelite. He was the seed of Abraham. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, and he was leading the rebellion. He says, so if these guys want to come and tell you anything, by the way, guess what? So am I. I can come and have the authority. That's the point. So he had every right to come and warn about these Judaizers, about these legalistic guys, because he was part of that. You see, it wasn't like he was coming and just speaking out against them, but hadn't been there. They had no right to say, hang on, he's just jealous. No, he'd been there, and he understood and he knew. And so therefore, he had every right to warn these folks. And folks, as we gather this morning, I warn you, I implore you, study the scriptures so that you can discern when someone is telling you a truth or a lie when it comes to God's word. Verse 23, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant. The apostle Paul wasn't scared of work, folks. He wasn't scared to provide for himself. He was a tent maker. And if needed, he was willing to do that. Now, he does right, and the scriptures clearly say that, you know, God has ordained those who preach the gospel should be able to live off that. I understand that. But Paul, the apostle, didn't do that because he was writing and ordaining the fact that and, and teaching that those who are preaching and teaching the gospel should be able to live off that, but he himself didn't do that. Why? Well, because he was writing it through God, the Holy Spirit, and he didn't want to be accused of, yes, but Paul, you're only writing that because so that you don't have to work. That's why he was a tent maker. That's why he provided for those, but yet he was writing through inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit. So therefore, we are so blessed, and I'm so thankful that I had the opportunity of being in the full-time ministry so that I can give attendance to reading and studying and so forth and be there for the folks. I I'm so grateful for that, but if that wasn't possible, well, then we have to make a plan. And there are many wonderful folk who are in the ministry that go out and have secular jobs. But obviously, it does detract from that. If they if they not don't have to, great. But if they do, no problem. And then he talks about the fact, he says, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. That's whiplashes, folks. That's beatings. In prisons more frequent, in deaths off, of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Now, what's he talking about? Five times he was beaten. Just keep your hand there and, uh, and go with me to Deuteronomy 25. Let me just read. What is he talking about here? Why was he beaten? And he says here, um, of, of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. In other words, how many lashes did he receive? 39. What's that got? Why? Why? Why would the Jews be beating him 39 times? Well, Deuteronomy 25, verse 1. If there be a controversy between men and they come into judgment, that the judges may judge them. This is now speaking about the nation of Israel and their rulership and their leadership. Then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. So was it lawful and legal to condemn somebody to be beaten? Yes, right? If, the, if the, the rulership, if it was a justified thing, yes. And it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face. In other words, this was not just 
vigilantism and going out. It was a structured, orderly thing. The person was brought in and accused, and they would find him guilty, and then the judge would say, right, bring him, put him down, lay him down. They would strip him and put him down, and he would be beaten before his face, according as his fault by a certain number, 40 stripes he may give him. So the maximum beating that this person could receive is how many stripes? 40. So Paul says five times he was beaten, 40 stripes saved one, 39 times. You know why they did that? They were beating him, first of all, unfairly. And then they want to beat him, but they want to keep the law, so they beat him only 39 times, just in case somebody counted miss. Have you ever had to count something, and then you count, and you get, and you get, okay, how many was that, and then you start all over again? So what these guys were doing in the crazy kind of thinking is we're going to beat this fellow, but we'll just make sure we only beat him 39 times, just in case one of us has counted miss. So they can feel good about themselves because they, they didn't go over the law. So they want to keep the law, but they forget the law that he should not be beaten unjustly. And he should be beaten in front of the magistrate or the judge. Do you understand that? This was not a vigilante, a vigilante go out and be. And yet, so they, they did what they wanted. But just so that they could be good enough, they would do 39. But five times, Paul says. So understand what's going on here. He's, he's facing these religious Folks who, who claim to be religious in one way, but in the other, they're actually not being fair and being right. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Thrice. So five times. Do you understand? <laughs> I don't know about you, but boy, oh boy, if, if Paul had to put out an advert and say that he's retiring from the ministry and he would like, <laughs> he wants to, I, I wouldn't apply for this job. Because, I mean, look what he faces. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. It is my belief and understanding that it was at that point in time where Paul writes and he says that he was, he entered and he saw into the third heaven. I think he was, I think it was there that, that God actually allowed him. He, he, he died and he was, he was resurrected. And you, and you can read about that in the book of Acts. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I was I have been in the deep. Plus all that, in journeys often. Now think about that. Like I said to you, I, I, I traveled from Port Elizabeth to Hookville, 300 and something kilometers to do a wedding. Did the wedding and then traveled 300 and odd, 600, let's call it 670 Ks I did in one day to go and do a wedding. How wonderful is that? Can you imagine if I was going by horseback? Jeez, I'd have to leave like what? Ten days before. And they probably end up walking after the first day because there ain't no way I'm going to be able to stay on the horse's back. Do you understand the privileges we have today? And here, Paul, this is what Paul's talking about. Folks, wherever Paul went, he walked or he, you know, he, he, he went on the back of a donkey or whatever or the case may be. But this was not just, oh, let me quickly just go down there. This was effort. This was energy. This was, this was not easy going. In journeys often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils by my own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. Notice false brethren. Those claiming to be righteous but were certainly not after him. In wearings and painfulness, in watchings. You know that word watchings? You know what that is? Sleepless nights. You know when you have a child or a grandchild and they go out and you know they've got to be back at a particular time and then you sit there and the time arrives that they should be home before cell phones this is, or tracker, or all of these other things. I don't know about you, but you get home, and boy, oh boy, there in the darkness, she sits. She sits. <laughs> the dad's gone to bed. He ain't going to wait anymore because he knows the wrath and fury that is now going to face 
you is going to be there. You know, you know that Rambo had this and this one had this firearm. Mom had the slipper. And you, that was it. Watchings, waiting, sleepless nights. How many times have you or you know of someone who's, who's prayed sleepless nights? You've got someone sick and ill. And that little one just doesn't want to go down. Sinjin, you know what I'm talking about. The watchings often. Watchings. Why? In hunger, in thirst, in fasting. That word first, going without food. In cold and nakedness. Folks, let's just stop here for a moment and say, do you, do you think Paul qualifies to tell us what to do. do? Do you think, I mean, we know that it is the truth of God's word. We know that God the Holy Spirit is working in and through him. But this is not a man arriving in a helicopter. This is not a man arriving in a limousine. This is not a man who changes his suit three times a day. This is not a man who has dominion over your faith. Or as we see some false apostles and women today that are Claiming all these things. Dressed to the hilt. This is a man who was willing to give his very life. Because he believed and totally accepted and acknowledged and knew the truth. And just to come and present a message. Boy oh boy. Walked. Blisters. Faced issues and challenges. That little chapel. That I was telling you about early, earlier, there was a, I didn't go and ring the bell, but I, I was very tempted. But why did they have bells? Well, because that bell would ring out early in the morning, wake you up and say, come on, it's time to come. And by the way, you know and understand why a bride arrives traditionally late for a wedding. You know why? It's because... Of the, the fact that in those days, people would have to travel from far. And she wouldn't want to embarrass any of her guests who may have had some traveling issues. So she purposefully would arrive late. So that those who had arrived and the, the horse had bolted and whatever, and they were now trying to catch the thing and tie them up and whatever have you. That's the reason. Okay? Folks, we live in a modern era. We've got, we got digital time. All right? Brides often say to me, how late am I allowed to arrive? I said, no problem. Your wedding's at two. I leave at three. You can come as late as you like. So you want a quick wedding? or <laughs> Kidding. That's the reason. And Paul the Apostle, he would arrive, he would teach, and he would get there and not be put up in some fancy hotel and then, you know, he probably, I, I think about this, get there and, he, and be wary. And you know what would be driving him? He needed to preach and teach this truth. And we need to, we need to get to a point where we as believers know and understand and, and really have God's word working effectually in us. And know and, and be mindful of this. That we are not judgmental, but that we certainly do judge and assess and see what is being said through, in and through God's word. Have a look what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Go with me to Matthew chapter 7. Math, Matthew records this when the Lord Jesus Christ was on earth, when he came. By the way, folks, he came and the Lord Jesus Christ came for the, for the nation of Israel to bring them back unto God. Because they were the very ones who were supposed to be carrying this truth into the lost world. And what was happening is they were lost themselves. Matthew 7 verse 15. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in what? Sheep's clothing. They look all harmless. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves, hungry, ravenous wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits, by their actions you will know them. Do men gather grapes of thorns? Or figs of thistles. 
Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit, worthless fruit. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ was warning here and warning about the false apostles, false prophets, false teachers who come in sheep's clothing. Oh, let's tell you something. Sounds so wonderful. But yet, it's not the truth. Paul the Apostle picks up on this. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And this is particularly, now I'm getting to, this is our day and age. So what's happening now? And I'm running out of time and we're going to have to pick up on this next week as we go. I've got 10 minutes to go. Let me get in what I can get in here. But this is important, folks. We need to be mindful. First Timothy chapter 4. This is, this is now. This is, this is now. How do we discern now? Now the Spirit. You see that's a capital S? That's the Holy Spirit. That's not your spirit. That's not your feelings. Now the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, that's His proper name. His function is the Spirit of God. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times shall, some shall depart from the faith. So now, now, folks, understand, we're not talking about people rejecting the truth. We're not talking about people and all the other religious activity that takes place. The false thinking and religion. He's talking about people that depart from the faith. That's from the message we preach and teach today, folks. That's people who should know better. So not only now... Is it the last? But we need to know in the in the latter times, shall, some shall depart from the faith. And that is what I'm what I see. I don't know. Uh, listen, I don't know when the Lord is returning. But boy, oh boy, I see people departing from the faith. Going after itching ears messages, going after feel good stuff. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines. That word doctrines means teachings of devils. What's the warning? They come in sheep's clothing. Woolen suits. Snazzy suits. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. That would be hypocrisy, piousness, self-righteousness. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. I don't know if you know or had, but you ever touch something hot and, <laughs> and it burns and you get the blister? And it's like, it feels strange. And, and this is talking about being burnt to the point that, that the, the very nerve endings are burnt. You get different degree burns. And folks, sometimes if, if, it, if it's a first degree, man, it, it stings. But sometimes if, it, if it's so bad, it even burns the very essence of um, feeling. And on the ships in the old days, when, you, when boy, oh boy, if you had a limb, they would, what would they do? Boil up tarn. Put it on there and seal it. Pain for a while and then gone. Why? The nerve endings are gone. And that's what these folks are saying. Having their conscience seared with the hot iron. Having no conscience. You've got to know and understand. We live in a day and an age where that is happening. Where we look at a lot of religious activity. And we, particularly in the churches, in, in so-called Christendom. And their conscience has been seared with a hot iron. And they think nothing of teaching you feel good stuff so they can get your money. And drive in the snazzy cars. And have dominion over your faith. Forbidding to marry. Now I thought about that. Forbidding to marry. Now bear with me for a moment. What do we find happening in our society right now? Conducted a wedding yesterday between a man and a woman. 
What do we find happening? Marriage is now being defined. Do you know that in France you can marry a dead person? Did you know that? Forbidding to marry. Taking the very essence of marriage and twisting it. And saying, marriage is no longer what marriage is defined by God's word. And commanding to abstain from meats. Or you better stop eating meat because the cows are letting off gas. That's messing with the ozone layer. Hello. Think about that for a moment. Now you've got to start eating hohos now and crickets. Now that you, you may say, oh, what's that? folks, please understand. Please understand the manipulation and the stuff that is happening around us. Now what do we do? Go out and hold up placards? No. Just be aware and know and understand that this is what's happening. And when is this going to take place? The spirit... It speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, please understand, if, if, if you don't want to eat meat and that's a choice you make, have at it. Please don't come and put dominion on my faith, however, that if I want to enjoy a steak, I'm going to enjoy it. Because God's word tells me I can. Look at verse 4. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Now, just think about what's happening. Like I say to you, I don't, I don't want to get emails and messages now from folks who are, yeah, but I'm vegan. That's fine. Have at it. But folks, that's becoming a religion. now. And what's happening is we are worshipping the creature more than the creator. Now, I'm all for keeping stuff clean and and and. And, we, you know, when the animals are cold and that, that it's humanely done, please understand. I know that and I understand that. But we live in a day and an age where I can tell you right now, whether you recognize this or not, you're too scared to speak out. Because of what's going to be said. I went to meet some folks in a restaurant in the city. When I went to the bathroom, there was a sign. You had a man, a woman, a half man, half woman, and then a little drawing of an alien in the city. And the wording was, whatever. Just wash your hands afterwards. So we're more worried about you bringing your hohos to the plate that you're going to use. But you want to be right. Folks, understand how we are being molded and shaped into believing this kind of stuff. And now you go into a bathroom and it's for anyone. But here's the thing. You send your little girl into that bathroom. And she can go into her own cubicle, but when she comes out, the wash basins are all shared. Something is not right, folks. What do you do? Be wary. Be watchful. You go to a place and it's like that. Moms, go with your daughter. It is sad that I have to stand here and Make you aware if you're not already aware of this. But you see, the problem is the enemy is subtle. And he's changed God's word. He's manipulating and changing the way people think. And we need to be mindful of that. We don't have to go out and create a mock and a havoc. We have to be mindful. We have to care for one another. We have to remind one another. We have to look out for one another. We don't have to live in fear, but we need to be mindful and not become complacent. 
The Apostle Paul warns us of this. Verse 14, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And next week I'll pick up on this. I, I never got near as far as I wanted to get today. But I believe we need to just, I want to show you through scripture. And next week I'm going to show you some Old Testament scriptures of exactly how God had set watchmen over the nation of Israel, had set religious leaders who should have been there as the, as the pastors, the shepherds of the flock, and they failed because of greed. And I do believe Satan's form of attack today is coming in a way that we need to be absolutely, totally mindful. Now, don't go out there and be all paranoid about it. Just be mindful. Just be mindful. Just like you wanted to make sure your little one got to Sunday school. You watched her go into that door. I applaud you for that. Even in this environment, I applaud you. Why? You can never be too careful. Never be too careful. Be mindful. In this city, in schools, that's happening. Be mindful. Be watchful. And where you can, take that stand for truth. Speak your say in a loving, kind, caring, compassionate way. But speak it nonetheless. In a non-pious way but speak it nonetheless. And if there are issues and challenges that you're battling to face with and you're not sure how you should react in certain ways, trust God's word. And we will gladly sit with you and go through and point you to scripture, not to have dominion over your faith and what you should or should not be doing, but how you can trust God's word to give you that inner peace and that comfort to face this world, which is changing at a rapid pace, folks. A rapid pace. Be aware. Be aware. But enjoy every day. Because God has got you. The Holy Spirit lives within you. He'll never let you go. Amen? We'll pick up on this next week, and I'll share some more thoughts with you on this as we go through next week. Father God, we give you thanks. We give you praise for the goodness of your grace and your mercy. And thank you that as we have just looked at your word this morning and the warnings you give to us, Lord, my prayer would be that not that we would have dominion over anybody's faith here. And not that we must now be in a state of panic or worry, but we need to just be watchful and mindful. Because those of us who, who take the time and, and, and the trouble to do, to do that, Often we frowned upon. But Lord, we pray you give us in and through your word that guidance, that comfort, that courage, that peace, so that we can make a difference in our family settings, our social settings, our work environments. And we as believers here that gather here Sunday by Sunday, those of folk who are online with us or listening to this, may know and understand that we can still take a stand for truth, but in a humble, meek, yet firm way. We thank you for this in and through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.